Welcome back, Generals. This is the Battle of First Bull Run, or First Manassas, depending on your point of view. I'm playing the Union on Major General Difficulty with the JMP mod, version 1.28.3. First thing I'm going to do is review what I did in camp to get ready for Bull Run. Second, I'll talk about some of the dynamics that you need to be aware of just before going into a grand battle. Then, once we get out to the battle, I'll show you the key to maximizing the amount of time that you have on Bull Run so you don't need to feel so pressed and try to rush tired units up to Henry Hill and end up with guys in poor condition when Johnson's counterattack starts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you how to have plenty of time to get ready. The first thing that I did was put my career point from distress call into army organization to get it to three so I can take 10 units to Bull Run. I'm not using any rep points here because I'm saving them for use after bull run. I have a one morale point penalty, but since everyone in my two divisions are one stars with veterans, it won't affect anything. I want to review and keep track of the progression of each of my units up to Shiloh to show you how I'm trying to maximize how many two and one star units I can get along the way. Once I get to Shiloh, I'll stop tracking that. Taking a look at Wagner, he had 1,538 men at distress call and he lost 79, which would put him down to 1,459, but he actually shows 1,460 men. Uh, that's not from rounding. Let me show you where that difference is coming from. So let's jump back to the battle report for distress call. Obviously, the casualty totals at the bottom were for both the core units and the allied units combined. The player's casualty subtotals show that I had 75 killed, 223 wounded, 37 missing, and 0 captured. Any troops that were killed or captured are gone forever. Any troops that were wounded will go through the casualty system, and a percentage of them will end up as your veterans ready to redeploy. If you want an in-depth explanation of the casualty system, please take a look at the video that I have that goes over that. The only change that's been made since that video was created is, originally, once a soldier made it out of the badly wounded pool and into the wounded pool, he wouldn't die. But as of mod version 128.3, 15% of the wounded pool die off after each battle. The last group are those that are missing at the end of the battle, and a percentage of them return to their unit after the battle, and the rest are deserters. Most people know that points in medicine will increase the number of men that are healed after a battle and go straight back to their unit, along with increasing the number of men that cycle through the casualty system to become vets. What many players overlook is that points in army organization and the level of your officer command is what determines how many of the missing men return to their units after a battle. In Wagner's case, it was only one man returning, but that was only because there's 37 missing to begin with. As the battles get bigger and you have much more AO, the difference will be greater. Wagner got 860 kills, and with one battle led, his experience penalty drops from 15% down to 7.5. So the net result is a 15-point experience gain from 60 up to 75. I've not changed anything about this unit, so he's going to bull run as is. Brewster got beat up more than Wagner and had less men to begin with. He started with 1385 and lost 120, uh, which would put him down to 1275. He got 560 kills plus the one battle lead point. I added vets to get him back up to 1375, so with those changes, that gives him a 17-point unit XP increase from 58 up to 75. Lepian lost 54 men and killed 387. I've not added anything to this unit, just let him bleed down. With his kills and his one battle lead point, uh, he jumped 19 XP from 63 to 82. Very similar with Braxton. He lost 73 and killed 360. Again, I haven't added any troops to this unit. With his kills and his one battle lead point, that jumped him 18 XP from 59 up to 77. 
As you may recall, I had 484 of Walton's vets in the vet pool before the stress call. I also got about 30 more vets from the casualty system, giving me just over 500. Some of them were used to make Peabody Skirmishers unit with just enough XP to get their one star. I gave them the tier one perk with the stealth accuracy and spotting. I don't want to say the perk's name because the names displayed currently uh, are incorrect in the mod. I know that Pandacrout will have that fixed before 128.4 comes out. They're also listed correctly in the most recent test version. So the important thing is that my first skirmisher always gets spotting. Skirmishers are the best spotters in the game with cav right behind them, but most people go with accuracy perks for their cav. This unit will eventually be a rapid fire, high accuracy unit equipped with Sharps M1859 rifles with the 140 fire rate. It will take them a while to level up to that much experience, so I want them to get started here. So he has 0 XP and is carrying 61 Springfields. I also used some of Walton's vets combined with the carbines I got at Distress Call to make my first cab unit, which is a 1 star with an accuracy perk. This unit will switch over to melee weapons after bull run, and then I'll give the carbines to another new unit that I create. But for now, this will get me through bull run and get them some experience. Woods got 422 kills at the stress call with no losses. Combined with the one battle led, he increased 13 experience points from 51 to 64. I didn't add any guns to Woods because I'm going to buy up all the 24 pound howitzers from the shop now, plus the ones with rep points after bull run and whatever ones are in the shop after bull run. So I'll have exactly 10 to give Woods that upgrade. Walton got 141 kills and lost 7 men, which I replaced. With one battle lead point, he increased 15 experience points from 57 to 72. In hindsight, I could have added two guns to Walton. I couldn't remember how many 20-pound parrots I would have after Shiloh, so I just left him at 10. But I will have 12 heavy guns for him post-Shiloh. Loomis had 278 kills and no losses. I used 50 vets to give him two more guns. Between the kills, added vets, and one battle led, his XP increased 21 points from 50 up to 71. Scales had 316 kills and lost three men. I replaced those with vets and also give him two more Napoleons. The combination of kills, vets, and one in battle sled bumped him up 20 unit experience points from 50 up to 70. So I did use up all of my vets. So I know that neither Martin nor Peabody are going to get their second star before Shiloh. So I don't have a particular goal in mind for them. But Wagner and Brewster probably need between 1300 and 1500 to get their second star at Bull Run. Braxton and Lepian are probably going to need between 400 and 500 to get their one star. Woods is going to need to spend a good amount of time repelling charges with canister fire to get the number of kills he needs since he's lagging behind everybody else. He probably needs a thousand or more, I would guess. Scales and Loomis are going to need around 800 or so. Walton should need the least, but that's mainly because of Walton's rank. Once he gets out of the experience penalty with two battles led, it'll help that unit experience, so he probably needs around 500 kills. We will see where it all shakes out after. One more big order of business before we start the battle. I have two points in the logistics. Your points from the logistics reset the shop after each grand battle. The weapons in the shop are buy them or lose them when the shop resets. Early on, it can visually appear as if nothing happened in the shop. So if I go down to the uh, heavy artillery, I have one Whitworth and one siege gun sitting here. And if I don't buy them after bull run, you'll see one of each in the shop again. And it might look like nothing happened. But that's actually two different guns, meaning that if I bought the one Whitworth here after Bull Run, there would be another one Whitworth there that I could buy. To get the he heavy guns as early as you can, you need to buy them up before each grand battle and just kind of let them sit until you can have enough to either field a new unit or switch them out to a veteran unit. 
Now, I'm not going to buy either of those. What I'm going to do is buy the 24-pound howitzers, the 20-pound parrots, the two James rifles, and all of the 12-pound howitzers. So I would say don't sleep on the 12-pound howitzer. It's always in the shadow of its bigger brother, but its bonus to canister range is 115%, which is the highest of any gun, and its base damage is still right up there with its big brother. When it comes to close support for your infantry right in the heart of the battle, these are the guns that you really want. Because you're going to cry if you lose a bunch of 24-pound howitzers. But if you build a large 12-pound unit that does devastating canister damage, you're not going to feel bad if you lose 5 or 6 of them in a fight. They are also light guns, so they move at a decent clip even without a horse perk. Jumping over to the cav weapons... With two in logistics, the Union could only get 500 of the Colts. Uh, by comparison, the CSA can get 1,200 at a time with even one in logistics. My Carbine Cav will swap out to Colts after Bull Run going up to Shiloh. So I'm buying 117 of these to go with the other 500 that I can get after the battle. Just to give me a few extras to manage losses in the side battles on the way up to Shiloh. In the skirmisher weapons, I took the Sharps rifles. The Sharps give you 140 fire rate with a little less distance than the JF Browns, but the fire rate on the Brown is only 90. You'll find that all of the skirmisher perks are great, and you really can't mess up taking any of them. However, I recommend that you pick which weapon that you want to use for the unit, and then select the perks that exploit that weapon's strengths. So if you want to go true snipers with a slow rate of fire at max distance and stay hidden, then go with the Browns. I'm stacking accuracy perks and going with the Sharps for the highest fire rate to start out, and I'll get some Browns later. I did not buy any infantry weapons. Some people make the mistake of thinking that the officers in the academy reset just like the shop. So they then buy up a bunch of officers. Officers are added to the academy after every grand battle, but they never disappear. So don't worry about losing these guys. If you're short on money, use your money to buy the weapons. These guys will still be sitting here after Bull Run to get hired. On a side note, there's a bug that has existed since the vanilla game, where wounded allied officers occasionally appear in the barracks. Harlan was the division command officer of the allies at Distress Call. So he's here, and after Bull Run, he'll be healed up, and I can use him. I put the last of my funds at the supply wagon. The Allied supply wagon is pretty big, and they are only supporting their six-pound artillery batteries. So I often swap my wagon with theirs in the battle. Uh, my wagon always runs empty sometime in the last phase, but it's never been an issue. And I can usually steal one of the AI's wagons in phase two to help out. Taking a quick look at the intelligence service report, I've got a single core reinforcement after distress call, so that will only increase the size of the AI army, and we can get started. On the core deployment screen, we are seeing 27,910 and 90 guns for the CSA, and 20,928 and 94 guns for me. First bull run normally goes pretty well for me, with the CSA having anything up to 35k. It's just a matter of managing my time, and I'm going to show you how to get the most time available to you. First things first, I will get the allied units heading towards the Ford and check out which perks I have. Next, I'll get my units headed towards their starting point. I like to come in from the north and pretty much ignore Matthews Hill. I make sure Loomis is in that first division that deploys, just to give him some extra time because he's going to be the slowest unit that I have.
The only action that I'm really looking for at the start is for Clay's Dragoons to try to cross the ford and attack. Like I've said before, it's just easier when the AI cab is removed from the field, and I like the allied units to try to take them out here. I always send this one detached skirmisher to get a little peek at what's happening on the other side of the bridge. Maybe 5 or 10% of the time it gets spotted quickly and fired upon, but if the AI doesn't see it, it can stay there almost indefinitely, and nobody will bother it. It can also tip you off to any units that start crossing the bridge to flank your Ohio and New York units. So we see the Louisiana Tigers and the Lynchburg Artillery are both singles. 
The default chance that any allied or AI unit splits is 20%, by the way. So in the base game and previous versions of the mod, it benefited you to use up all the time in phase one because all of the allied units were coming onto the field and you could get them in place to start the battle. However, in version 128, the only units on the field are the Ohio and New York units that come in from the right and your core units. The majority of your allies won't come in until phase two from the west. Well, if you use up all of the time in phase one, you'll get about two and a half to 245 for phase two, and it's gonna take about 25 minutes to move those allies from the west down into position for the battle, leaving you with about two hours before you need to be up on top of Henry Hill. But if you cut phase one short, any time left in phase one gets added to phase two up to a maximum of three hours and 15 minutes. Once you subtract the 25 minutes it takes for Keys and Sherman and the gang to get in place, you'll end up with about two hours and 50 minutes to get up to Henry Hill. And that extra 50 minutes does a lot. So my advice is to trip the timer for phase one early, like within the first 30 minutes to force phase two to start. And the fastest ways to do that is to move your cab around behind the CSA like I'm doing here and get near the farm. I do not recommend crossing the river because when phase two starts, your cab might be right in the range of the phase two units for the AI that spawn on the field. I'm playing a little bit of cat and mouse with the scouts here to try to get the AI's attention and not bother my carving cab as they go in to try to trip the phase. All right, I tripped the phase. Now to extract my cab back out of here and do a ton of micromanagement to get everybody into place. So I have the full three hours and 15 minutes, but we definitely want to move along. But I will have time to rest guys when they need it. Generally, when a unit gets below 70% condition or morale, I'll try to give them a timeout and let them sit until it's back up over 95% or better. Obviously, that can't always happen depending on what the battle conditions are, but that's always the goal. So it looks like I got a split on Howard and Hunt. I always hope for at least four guns from this group. I then move four infantry backed by four guns towards the river 
and any of the additional infantry that are here, I send over to link up with my core units to come in from the north side. With all the detached skirmishers I have, I'm going to have a big old death by a thousand paper cuts game, and that'll be extremely effective later on when we get to phase three. My detached are linking up with the Ohio and New York to help them across the Ford. Ideally, my core units and the CAV will take out uh, Bartos brigades and Pelham's artillery, but it just depends on how the AI plays it.
Stewart. Stewart's two cab units want to just stand here going toe to toe with my guys. That's fine with me. I guess I'm going to have to move my little detached skirmisher scout here up to help out with everything that's going on on this side. Helen's artillery shattered. I know some players want to rush to try to catch the AI in the river. However, whomever walks or runs the furthest uses up the most condition. So I'm happy to let him come out a little bit further to me at the beginning, and I'll end up on the river eventually. The Allies detached are just screening for my core units plus Howard's brigades while they get into place, so the AI infantry doesn't try to charge them early.
have the 27th Virginia Charging. We have Heroic. Shots. Steady. Waverling, Countercharge, Rowdy. Keys is backing these guys up if there's a charge. Mark those wavering, so I'm now going to switch my artillery. I'm going to see if my scouts can help out on the right, maybe get that supply wagon while they're at it. Once a unit is routing or wavering and they're in melee, you can ignore them and start targeting whoever else is available. See, Sherman's probably going to need a break after this fight.
Okay, I can get everyone over the ford now and start progressing towards the river. So we've done a decent amount of fighting to start early on, but if I had not tripped the phase one timer, we would just now be getting the position to start fighting. I don't normally cross the bridge with units because they usually go across the ford, but with the way this is playing out, that's probably what I'm going to do here. Sherman, Keyes, Franklin, and Wilcox are all in the right place now. Just need to get their artillery up behind them.
Tigers have moved out of the fortification on the bridge, so I can get a little bit more aggressive on that side now. I just keep moving forward, pushing the AI units back, focus as much fire as possible, rest guys when I need to. There's just so much going on that I always lose track of somebody and that's normal. I obviously want my guys to get as much experience as possible, but I don't mindfully start keeping track of their kills until we get to the last phase. Detached skirmishers were kind of useless prior to uh, 1.28, so if you've not been making good use of them, I'm hoping that this battle can show you how useful that they can be on the offensive.
So Braxton is tired and Lepian is exhausted, so I'm going to sit them for now. I have plenty of time to make it up to Henry Hill.
any of the detached that are starting to get shot up, I'll reattach and then I'll detach them again at the start of the last phase. I typically rely on the Allied units to lead the assault on Henry Hill backed by artillery. Uh, if they do start to have trouble with condition and morale, then I'll commit my core units, but there tends to be a lot of casualties that happen right here. When an AI unit is charging and they are down to steady, if my unit has higher morale, I tend to just hold my ground or I will counter charge because the AI unit needs just a little bit of push to go to wavering and then routing. Once the AI starts fielding three star units on a regular basis, it can become a little more tricky to decide when to fall back and when to hold your position.
As much as I just like to charge all of the artillery sitting on the hill up there, there's just way too many hidden units waiting to attack. I'd lose a ton of men trying to take them out right now. So I just have to accept some losses from the artillery fire at the moment. Once my guys get into place, we can drive them back or eliminate them. It just seems forever to push the unit out of this fortification. When the 4th Carolina leaves the Ford as Phase 2 starts, this is usually where they end up. They're finally routing. I have 30 minutes left to get organized, set up for the counterattack, and rest up. Of course, that assumes I don't accidentally trigger the VP too early.
I try to put the biggest and healthiest units up front, let anyone tired rest behind them. I also position my artillery into three groups and I put them on a hotkey so I can quickly focus fire during the counterattack. So my Death by a Thousand Paper Cuts gang will work together with the Cav to intercept Yule from whatever direction he's coming from. I basically move them off to the right, spread them out to scout, and then whenever Yule pops up I just kind of move them all in that direction. I try to use cover as much as possible for my infantry and then back them up with artillery out in the open. Artillery and cover do less damage, usually about 80% of normal. So having them in the open behind the artillery allows them to fire with max damage. triggered the VP a little bit early just because I have all my forces up there, but it's no big deal. I'll still have plenty of time in this phase to do everything that I want and get everybody rested. If Ewell comes from the east across the bridge, the three detached here will hold him up while my big group moves around the flank. If he comes from the southeast, my big group will slow him down. If he comes from the south with everybody else, then my detached will fold in and flank from the right.
All right, he's coming from the southeast. Obviously, the detached don't do a lot of damage per volley, but they still affect the AI unit morale, so a big group of them can route much larger units when working together. I'm going to move Wagner and Brewster to take on Yule, backed up by Scales and Woods Artillery Batteries. I'll have to reset my artillery hotkeys after moving Scales and Walton off to the side. With everyone rested now, I'm going to reorganize a bit and pull some of them up closer to the front.
So the CSA group that comes in with Ewell wants to come in and flank from the right. So I'm going to move a bunch of my detached out of the way and kind of open the door to allow him to come up that way. That way I can set up an ambush area. I really hope that this main CSA force does some good charging so my artillery gets some experience. Loomis and Woods are still in that main defensive area waiting for their chance. Loomis can fire shell all day, but Woods definitely needs the AI to be charging. Wagner and Brewster are both in the 600 on kills, not counting their detached skirmishers. Since they're going to need close to 1500 here to get their second star, we're going to have to put a lot of work in. Braxton and Lepian should get their one star with around 400.
So it looks like the CSA is finally going to come play. So it looks like I'm going to have to move Brewster and Wagner across the river here to get some kills. I'll also get my cave involved. Anybody routing is a meal for the big bed wolf.
Brewster's Detached have 305 kills and Wagner's have 373, so they're doing some pretty good work. All of these guys here can get set up to start flanking the main force. Time to get Lepian and Braxton moving. They're detached, are going to get some nice kills though. Now I just have my core units firing into Yule's group so they can maximize their kills and they'll pull off any of the allied unit detached.
time to get all these guys headed back to the west. Even if they don't get there in time to get more kills, at least they can get some stamina from the marching.
mind. I end up cutting it close on whether or not I can full clear this because all of the AI units are routing. So I lost 86 of my core, I had 256 wounded, and 40 missing. I captured 3,618 of the CSA and had just under 19,000 kills. Brewster and Wagner both got 1,600 kills with minimal losses. Lepian and Braxton are both over 400. My dedicated skirmisher got almost 800. Loomis, Scales, and Woods are all in the 600 range, and Walton had 300. My KF got 500. Looks like Wagner made it to general. We got a bunch of muskets and 42 Springfields, and I'll be putting those to use on a bunch of rookie units that I'm going to be making at my next camp. All of my infantry gained a star along with Walton and Loomis. So who would have guessed that the Ordnance Rifles and the Six Pounders would be the two artillery units that got to two star before the Napoleon batteries got there. Thank you for watching, Generals, and River Crossing will be up next.